Good afternoon. The first item of business is portfolio questions. And the questions today are on health and sport. Question number one, Neil Bibby. The Scottish Government, when it last met NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, and what issues were discussed? Jane Freeman. Ministers and Scottish Government officials regularly meet with representatives of all health boards, including Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Neil Pepe. The Health Secretary will, will be aware that Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board is considering changes to breast cancer services. At the weekend, the Greenock Telegraph reported on a Freedom of Information request by Martin McCluskey, which showed not a single patient from Inverclyde was consulted on the proposal to close the breast cancer services at the IRH. Can the Health Secretary reassure local campaigners and confirm that breast cancer services at Inverclyde Royal will remain open and that these proposals will be shelved for good? Jean Freeman. Uh, I, I thank Mr Bibby for uh, his supplementary question. Um, as I understand it, what Greater Glasgow and Clyde is doing in terms of their review of acute and critical care under the banner of moving forward together is at this point no specific service proposals are included in that. Uh, as Mr Bibby knows, uh, should the Health Board want to make significant changes to service provision uh, in any part of its remit or its geography, those significant changes do require to have significant public consultation and I am very keen to ensure that that is genuine uh, and genuine uh, engagement and of course those proposals then come to me as Cabinet Secretary to reach your view as to whether or not I concur with them. I hope that is sufficient assurance for him at this point about the process that we'll go through and my understanding is that there are yet, as yet no specific proposals at all and they would need to be subject to uh, due public consultation. I'll take two supplementaries and would ask you to be quite quick with them. Stuart McMillan followed by Annie Wales. Thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the, the right to raise genuine concerns about the Health Board are pivotal in holding both the Government but also the Health Board to account? But also acting responsibly is also crucial in this area and it's something that the Labour Party continually fail at with our, constant, with our constant negativity and talking down the NHS and talking down the services within the IRH. Jean Freeman. Uh, um, thank you to Mr McMillan. Um, I, I agree that uh, it is important, and I've said it before in this chamber, it is important that we discuss our National Health Service and uh, where there are challenges and where uh, opposition members have criticisms of this government, then they should absolutely raise those. Uh, but that we need to do that within the overall context of recognising that our health service is performing well, notwithstanding significant challenges that we have to meet. And what we need to be able to do is not take single bits of information out of context and then claim, make assertions and claims uh, on the back of those. Uh, I'm not casting aspersions anywhere across this chamber. I think that is an important uh, lesson for us all to learn and an important approach for us all to sign up to. Annie Wells. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Latest statistics revealed that less than 80% of cancer patients in NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde received their first treatment within the 62-day Scottish Government targets in the last quarter. And I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary spoke in waiting times yesterday. But what action will be taken in the immediate months ahead to reassure cancer patients that they won't wait, be waiting longer than the treatment time guarantee? Jean Freeman. Uh, I'm grateful to uh, Ms Wells for that question. Of course, before I answer it, it is important in terms of context to say that the 31-day target uh, is being met uh, across our health boards. Uh, Ms Wells is absolutely right, though, to raise very poor performance in terms of, of the 62 days. And in the plan that I uh, published yesterday, that covers uh, our, our intention uh, to work towards meeting uh, that target date. And that is particularly with respect to diagnostics and the specific actions I outlined initially uh, coming on from this month, uh, Golden Jubilee in terms of MRI and other scanning uh, technologies will increase the diagnostic capacity available uh, to Greater Glasgow and Clyde. But in addition, uh, as we now uh, from today work towards driving on that waiting times improvement plan, then we are looking uh, at each board and asking them very specific questions about what they're going to do and how they will make best use of those additional funds I also announced. 
Question number two, Jamie Halcrow Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government what action the Health Secretary is taking to support those most vulnerable to the effects of winter weather. Jean Freeman. The Scottish Government has invested an additional £10 million to support boards and their partners to develop their winter plans. The winter plans should ensure adequate staffing cover in place across acute primary and social care settings, that patients are discharged as soon as they are ready on weekdays, weekends and public holidays, and with their partners put in, steps, play, uh, put in place uh, steps to avoid unnecessary admissions and to ensure that elective procedures are protected as far as possible so they continue throughout the winter period. These plans, once they are approved, uh, will be published shortly. I also launched the, this year's flu vaccination programme on the 1st of October, uh, targeting more than 2 million Scots and have recently uh, been uh, seeing for myself some of the work that our frontline health staff are doing in order to encourage their peers to be vaccinated. Jamie Halcrow Johnson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Recently released figures show that last win winter saw the highest recorded increase in winter deaths in Scotland in 18 years. And it's only October, yet across Scotland we've seen, uh, already heard of a shortage of flu vaccination in many pharmacies. In my own region, my, many older people in Orkney and Shetland are already struggling to keep their homes warm because of high rates of fuel poverty. And in Murray, my colleague Douglas Ross MP raised the case of an expectant mother forced to endure a 60 mile trip to Aberdeen to deliver her child due to the downgrading of a maternity unit at Dr. Gray's hospital in Elgin. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, given that we know the extensive pressures already faced by the NHS across the Highlands and Islands, is the Cabinet Secretary confident that as winter approaches, all NHS boards in Scotland are ready to meet the challenges faced by winter weather? Jean Freeman. Well, as I mentioned, those uh, winter plans uh, are precisely there to, in order to provide me with that degree of reassurance and to let me question where I don't think uh, boards have sufficiently planned based on the lessons learned from last winter, which was, of course, one of the most severe on record. And those plans, when I said once approved, will be published shortly, they are coming to me in order for me to look at those. In terms of uh, the deaths uh, that uh, Mr Halco Johnson referred to, of course, those arose as a result of that severe weather from flu, respiratory infections and others. And the plans are designed uh, to ensure that we are as prepared as possible for that worst winter. The uh, question about flu vaccination and the supply of vaccinations, uh, what we have experienced is what happens is that you order on the basis, you get a number of delivery drops of the flu vaccines. Uh, you order on the basis of what the take up was the year before and you order each of those delivery drops on the basis of that data. In this year, the first uh, delivery drop has not been adequate to the demand that has come through. That doesn't mean we're wrong about the demand, it just means that more people have come forward early, and therefore we've not had all the supplies. But the supplies are, are uh, coming through as we anticipated uh, them to be, and we will have sufficient vaccine for everyone. Two final points, given there were a number of points to Mr Halcrow Johnson's question. In terms of Dr Gray's, uh, members will be aware, I'm sure, that I have uh, asked for uh, a very detailed plan about how we will begin to move back towards the reinstatement of all services at Dr Gray's. The first plan that I received was insufficient, uh, in my view, uh, in terms of its timeline and its content, and I would hope in the course of the next 10 days or so to be able to approve the additional work that I think is necessary in the, the short to medium term uh, to move back towards uh, full services at Dr Gray's. And the last point I will make uh, with respect to the question on fuel poverty, obviously other portfolios carry uh, that responsibility. A great deal of work is being done across this government, but I cannot sit down without making the point that if the UK government paid proper attention to what is required in terms of benefits and support to our most vulnerable citizens, then we would see a great deal less in the way of poverty as a whole, and fuel poverty included. Supplementary from Liam MacArthur. Thank you very much. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that longer, uh, harsher winters are just one of the reasons why uh, Orkney has the highest levels of fuel poverty uh, anywhere in the country, and the health impacts that uh, come as a result of that. Can she therefore um, redouble efforts to uh, press upon her uh, colleague, the Housing Minister, to ensure that the fuel poverty legislation makes specific reference to the rural minimum income standard uh, for the criteria for assessing fuel poverty and directing support to where it needs to go? Jean Freeman. I'm grateful to Mr MacArthur for that um, 
question, uh, as he knows in a previous role, uh, this, this was a subject that I took a great deal of interest in with my uh, colleague, Mr. Stewart. Uh, I understand the issues that he is raising uh, in terms of uh, my portfolio in health. We have made sure um, that Mr. Stewart is aware of those matters, particularly in our more remote and rural communities, uh, and I'm confident that he is giving them all due and proper consideration. Uh, can I remind members that I do wish to take supplementaries, but questions and answers already have been fairly long. So unless members are willing to cut that down, uh, we won't get through nearly so many. Question number three has not been lodged. Question number four, Kezia Dugdale. Do you ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to introduce a right to rehabilitation for patients with chest, heart and stroke conditions? Jean Freeman. Early assessment and provision of rehabilitation in the first few days following an acute stroke by multidisciplinary working achieves the best outcomes for the person and is therefore a priority within the Scottish Stroke Improvement Plan with each NHS board reporting on progress as well as sharing good practice. We also recognise that pulmonary rehabilitation is an important element of respiratory care and it is a key recommendation in our national clinical guidelines which boards are expected to follow. Access to pulmonary rehabilitation will form an important part of our respiratory care action plan for Scotland. Kezia Dugdale. Thank you, President Officer. With respect, I asked whether people would have an automatic right to it rather than just access to it. And can I remind the Health Secretary that there are 9,000 people across the Lothians who would benefit from pulmonary rehab, but there's only capacity for 1,100 people to actually get it. So without a right to rehab, how can my constituents expect to see that gap close? Jean Freeman. I'm grateful to Ms Dogdale for her supplementary question and I do of course understand that in a recent meeting with Chest Heart and Stroke Scotland we began the discussions on their campaign at uh, one in five uh, and we will continue those discussions and see uh, how we can move towards the end result that they and I believe Ms Dogdale is looking for but in, at this point the right thing for me to do is to continue those discussions to then be able to ensure that if we make a commitment it is one that we can meet. Question number five, Bob Doris. To ask the Scottish Government how it ensures that people who are homeless are not disadvantaged from accessing a GP. Jean Freeman. The Scottish Government published a guide for healthcare providers of general medical services on the 20th of September this year. The guidance clarifies that the inability by a patient to provide identification or proof of address is not considered reasonable grounds to refuse or delay registering a patient. The guidance clarifies that practices can use agreed addresses such as a homeless centre, a practice's own address or no fixed abode to register a patient and that street homelessness can be considered residence in a practice area. Bob Doris. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. My constituent who is currently homeless has two children staying temporarily with a friend. When her youngest child needed a GP's appointment, this was refused with homelessness cited as a reason, my office's intervention secured an appointment and I, have not, and I note that I have not named the practice publicly because I'd rather promote improved practice rather than, than shame them in this case. However, uh, can I ask that whilst the vast majority of GPs' practices do fulfil their obligations, how can the Scottish Government yet again remind GPs' practices of their responsibilities and are there any actions that can be taken regarding GPs' practices that behave in such ways? Jean Freeman. Um, we, we not only published the guidance, but we asked that boards ensured that that was circulated to all GP practices and that boards would follow that up. In addition, we have a primary care uh, performance improvement plans coming forward, and I would be looking to ensure that uh, GP practices within those primary care areas uh, understand what the guidance uh, is and are making sure that they uh, abide by it. What I would ask um, is that any, if any member uh, has a situation, as Mr Doris has described, that they bring that to our attention as quickly as possible so that we can ensure that it is uh, addressed as quickly as possible. And uh, in addition, through the Health and Care Social Partnerships and our work with COSLA, uh, I do intend to raise with them to ensure not only that GP practices know that this is our guidance, but that uh, teams working with those who are homeless, whether that's street teams or in whatever other fashion, that they too are aware of this guidance and can uh, advocate on behalf of those individuals' rights. Uh, one supplementary, Mary Fee. 
Thank you, President Officer. Given the links between transmittable diseases such as tuberculosis and homelessness, how will the Scottish Government ensure that homeless people, including destitute and homeless asylum seekers, can reach out to health services and prevent the spread of transmittable diseases? Jean Freeman. I'm grateful uh, to uh, Ms Fee for that question. It is a very important one and I would draw her attention, uh, not as a complete answer, but as part of an answer uh, to practice uh, here in this city that I visited very early on uh, as a Cabinet Secretary, where in that practice team, they have uh, street homeless workers, housing, uh, GPs and others, addiction workers and other support uh, staff, all working as one single team shortly to move uh, uh, I'm pleased to say, to new and more bespoke premises. Um, that example for me is an example of what we should see uh, in other areas where we have significant numbers of homeless people. And it is one that I am raising and trying to uh, ensure is adopted elsewhere as part of the other work that I'm talking about, which is about raising the pace and spreading good practice where we expect to see it. Question number six has been withdrawn. Question number seven, Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. I refer members to my register of interest as the Lung Health Cross Party Group convener to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the work of the Respiratory Improvement Task Force. Jean Freeman. Um, as uh, I'm, I'm sure Ms Harper knows, uh, in Scotland, respiratory managed clinical networks exist in most health boards working to improve respiratory health and quality of life for patients. The National Advisory Group is the overarching group and they began the work in terms of the task force um, that Ms Harper refers to. They are currently at the, if you like, the final stage, which is what they describe as the task and finish group, which will set up a respiratory action plan in Scotland. Emma Harper. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and I agree a great deal of work has already been undertaken by the National Advisory Group. And I understand that the group now led by Tom Farden has a key aim to publish an improvement plan. Can she therefore provide an update as to when a draft or a final plan will be presented on this important work? Jean Freeman. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, my understanding is that we are expecting uh, the plan to be published in mid to late 2019. Question number eight, Miles Briggs. Ask the Scottish Government uh, how the extra funding that it announced in July 2018 to support breastfeeding services has been distributed. Joe Fitzpatrick. Thank you. The Scottish Government has provided additional funding to health boards, third sector and other partners to meet the costs of local quality improvement projects and initiatives aimed at improving the breastfeeding experience for women across Scotland. Miles Briggs. I thank the Minister for that answer. I recently met with mums here in Lothian who told me about training of superior, uh, peer support group network. Um, specifically, they asked me to raise the issue that the £2 million which the Minister mentioned has not provided funding to help support that. So specifically, can I ask the Minister if he's willing to investigate the establishment of a breastfeeding peer support fund for the NHS boards across Scotland to develop this vital network and the delivery of training and resources for peer support across Scotland? Joe Fitzpatrick. Peer, peer support is, is a very important aspect and it is one of the areas that I expect our funding to support, as well as directly funding um, boards. Um, other organisations that we've, we've funded include the Breastfeeding Network, National Childbirth Trust, the LLL, uh, BBF, Napa University and, and UNICEF BFI. Um, I will... Um, come back to the member with that, that specific point as, as, as whether the peer support is not being supported in Lothian. I know my officials have um, a meeting with NHS Lothian to discuss their review of, of breastfeeding services across Lothian, so I will come back to the member after that meeting. One supplementary, Daniel Johnson. The changes to the referral system mean that breastfeeding clinics that originally served up to 60 women a week are now only serving uh, 12 in NHS Lothian. Indeed, information they provided shows that attendance at specialist breastfeeding clinics has dropped by over 50% in the last year. So does the Minister agree with the changes that have been made by NHS Lothian? And if not, what will he do about it? Joe Fitzpatrick. As I, I said to Mr Briggs, my officials will be meeting with NHS Lothian soon to discuss the changes um, to make sure that they are um, meeting the, the needs of the small number of women who experience problems um, um, which impact on their breastfeeding journey. But I'm happy to continue to update the member along with Mr Briggs. 
Question number nine, Angus MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government. To ask the Scottish Government what support it is providing to ensure that there are more changing places toilet facilities throughout Scotland. Joe Fitzpatrick. We are committed to increasing the number and locations of changing place toilets in Scotland. There are currently 178 changing place toilet facilities across Scotland and one Pamilu, uh, a portable changing place toilet. Angus MacDonald. I thank the Minister for his reply and I welcome the progress that has been made so far as a result of the campaign by PAMIS and others who I know uh, greatly appreciate the support they've received from a number of uh, ministers and cabinet secretaries, secretaries in the Scottish Government. Uh, the announcement prior to summer recess from Minister Kevin Stewart confirming that he intends to introduce changing places toilets into Scottish building regulations for certain types of new buildings was good news for the campaigners. And whilst it's very welcome indeed, can the Minister advise if the Government will encourage Scotland's NHS boards and other public bodies to retrofit changing places toilets in the premises the length and breadth of the country. Joe Fitzpatrick. So um, the member mentioned PAMIS and the Scottish Government continues to work closely with PAMIS, um, the organisation that campaigns to ensure that um, in Scotland people with profound and multiple learning disabilities and their families have access to changing place toilets where they need them in the, in the, in the community. We are very confident that the proposed requirement for changing place toilets in certain types of new large buildings um, through the review of the Scottish Building Regulations, which the member mentioned, will significantly increase the availability of changing place toilets in buildings. But I commit to continue to um, work with um, PAMIS and others to make sure that we have those changing place uh, toilets where they are needed. Uh, I have two supplementary questions. First of all, Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the commitment to support the increase of changing places toilet facilities, but the question comes at a time when public toilets are vanishing from our communities. Can the Minister advise what work has been undertaken to assess the public health impact of these toilet closures? Joe Fitzpatrick. Obviously, um, many of the decisions which I, I know that some members from um, across the chamber have concerns about uh, decisions that local authorities have made to close public toilets. Um, I'd encourage any local authority to consider very carefully the, the implications when they are changing any service going forward. And I know that's something that's been a particular concern to members from the, from the, the, the Highlands and Islands area. Um, but I, I don't think the member would be expecting me to, to, to stand here and tell local authorities what to do. But I, I do hope that going forward they, they, they take account of um, the, the needs of, of their residents when making any service changes. Mark MacDonald. Um, it was great to see the changing places toilet being opened at Aberdeen Airport in my constituency as part of the terminal redevelopment. Um, further to the point made by Angus MacDonald around retrofitting, while it is very welcome that new buildings will have an, a requirement introduced, can the Minister perhaps undertake to have discussions with his colleagues about what requirements could be uh, placed where refurbishment and redevelopment are taking place, which would obviously not be categorised as new build, but nonetheless might open up opportunities for changing places toilets to be installed? Joe Fitzpatrick. I, I, I think the member makes a good point. Clearly, it is much easier to make these changes by design in new buildings um, and, and retrofitting can pose, pose challenges. But I think the member makes a, a very good point, which I will follow up on in, in relation to refurbishment. Question number 10, Willie Rennie. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the proposed closure of the primary care emergency service facility in St Andrews. Jean Freeman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Fife, and, uh, Fife Health and Social Care Partnership undertook a review of the route of our services in line with the recommendation in Sir Lewis Ritchie's National Review on out of our services and undertook an option appraisal exercise between August and October 2017. I understand there is currently uh, a consultation uh, being, uh, going underway, uh, which, will which has concluded uh, with uh, consideration of the of the results of that consultation on wider uh, primary care and other services across Fife uh, coming uh, to their joint board, the Integration Joint Board, at its meeting on the 20th of September. However, as I, I'm sure Mr Rennie will know, GPs in North East Fife uh, have offered to keep the local service running overnight. And I understand that in the next few weeks, the partnership will continue to work closely with them uh, and on those services to look and see how they can develop proposals uh, in the light of the consultation feedback, but also in the light uh, of what those GPs are bringing forward by way of a proposition. 
Willie Rennie. Uh, the Health Secretary will know from her own visit to St Andrews in recent weeks that there's a lot of anger in the town and across East Fife, with over 6,000 people signing a petition and packed public meetings in opposition to the proposed closure. We've got a rural, remote student population, an elderly population, and as the Health Secretary has said, local GPs are prepared to step up and provide a service. So I'm keen to understand what the Health Secretary will do if the Fife Health and Social Care Partnership do proceed with this closure. Will she step in and change their mind? Jean Freeman. Thank you. I'm grateful to Mr. Rennie for that supplementary question. I, I do understand uh, the anger and the concern that is being expressed. And I also understand uh, from my own constituency, uh, apart from anything else, how it is all too often easy to look at a map and think that an area is relatively uh, straightforward to move across uh, in terms of transport without taking account that it is a remote and at times uh, rural area and it is uh, less easy to actually do it in practice than it may seem if you use Google Maps or some other device. So I completely appreciate the concerns that are being <coughs> expressed. Uh, I would not myself personally want to uh, wait until final proposals uh, are brought forward, but uh, I am actively pursuing uh, being kept up to date with the thinking uh, in Fife and in the uh, Health and Social Care Partnership about how they will move forward on the wider consultation, of course, but specifically in these matters uh, which directly affect the access that patients have uh, to the care that they need. Uh, and I hope to be able to update Mr Rennie and other colleagues uh, with an interest in this uh, matter from their constituency perspective over the course of the next few weeks. Mark Crystal. Thank you. Does the Cabinet Secretary believe that the retention of out-of-hours services in St Andrews, particularly at the weekend, would be more likely if the Health and Social Care Partnership adopted more of a multidisciplinary approach, which is less reliant on GPs? Jean Freeman. Well, I, th I think there's two points. I mean, part of the difficulty we have with out-of-hours services is two parts to the difficulty. One is that the 2004 contract for GPs um, specifically said that they did not have to work out of hours. And you couple that with the uh, uh, national pension cap, which makes it more difficult, then we have struggled to have GPs uh, wanting to work out of hours. What is important in that respect is the new GP contract. Uh, so Lewis Ritchie's recommendations and the new GP contract uh, agreed with the uh, uh, BMA uh, makes it very clear that out of our services should be GP led. That said, the other parts of that GP contract, the new one that has been agreed, um, absolutely uh, recognise the importance of multidisciplinary teams and place the GP as the local clinical leader, the uh, medical general specialist uh, in an area who is working uh, with those multidisciplinary teams uh, to provide uh, services uh, not only uh, out of hours, but uh, for the rest of the time too. So Mr. Ruskell makes an important point. I think it's important for us to understand, uh, at least in part, why we have some of the difficulties with out of our services that we have at the moment, but also to recognise that we are now moving to a situation where GPs who uh, work under the new contract will be working in, under a contract that says specifically that out of our services should be GP-led. That doesn't preclude others, of course. Question number 11, Maurice Corey. Government, what role the Minister of Public, for Public Health, Sport and Wellbeing is having with its plans to bring the Invictus Games to Scotland and what discussions he has had with the Cultural Secretary on this? Joe Fitzpatrick. Cabinet Secretary for Culture and Veterans Minister uh, confirmed the Scottish Government's interest in considering whether Scotland should host the Invictus Games in the future. This can, however, only happen through the appropriate formal bidding process and would be informed by a feasibility study to determine the viability of hosting. We will learn from the current Games in Sydney to assist our considerations. The Scottish Government commend and congratulate the athletes currently competing in this year's Invictus Games. And I thank the member for giving me the opportunity to put in that con on record that congratulations. Maurice Corey. I thank the Minister for his answer. And by holding the Invictus Games here in Scotland, it would demonstrate how highly our armed forces disabled veterans are respected here. Uh, would the Minister do all he can to have the Scottish Government bid for the fourth Invictus Games being held here in Scotland? Joe Fitzpatrick. Um, the, the, the member um, 
makes a, a strong point in terms of um, the, the, the value of sport um, for our, our, our veterans. I was uh, very uh, privileged to be able to spend some time at the National Centre for Sport in Largs, which um, to see their para facilities, it's the, the first fully inclusive national sports centre, second to none in, in the UK. And when I, when I was there, I managed to meet with and, and discuss sport with um, some um, members who were being supported by Help for Heroes. They were they were serving armed, armed personnel um, who were using sport to help with their rehabilitation. So the power of sport, um, I think, is, is really, really important. I think we've got some fantastic facilities that would, would be a strong argument for Scotland being a location. There has to be a proper bid process. Um, I think it's, it's very important that we use this year's um, Sydney um, Games um, to help understand the size, scale and delivery um, of a future Games here in Scotland as a pre prelude to um, a, a possible um, future feasibility study. But my, my support would be there along with the Cabinet Secretary and the Minister for Veterans that, that we should look to Scotland making that initial feasibility study. Question number 12, David Torrance. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve access to mental health services for the LGBT plus people. Claire Hockey. <laughs> Thank you, President Officer. We are engaging with LGBT plus groups to support implementation of our mental health strategy, suicide prevention action plan Every Life Matters, and in the work of Children and Young People's Mental Health Task Force. Up to 2019-20, we're investing £54 million to help boards improve access to mental health services. Our programme for government also sets out a £250 million package of measures to support positive mental health and prevent ill health. This funding aims to ensure that high quality mental health services are accessible to everyone. David Torrance. The achievements of Kirkcaldy High School's LGBT plus group were recognised at the recent COSLA Excellence Awards. How important does the Minister consider groups such as this to be as we continue to challenge prejudice and inequality and improve the confidence and mental health of LGBT young people? Claire Hockey. I thank Mr Torrance for his supplementary. I would like to congratulate Kirkcaldy High School on their work and I would ask that the member pass on my congratulations to the school. Work like this is vital to ensure young people are confident in talking about issues that affect them. At each meeting of the Children and Young People's Mental Health Task Force, Dame Denise Coya will share the chair with a member of the Youth Commission, ensuring voices of children and young people are kept at the centre of this work. Young people are bringing an LGBTI voice to the Youth Commission, and as part of its research, the Youth Commission plans to meet with LGBT Scotland. Question number 13, Liam Kerr. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reach the 60% target of frontline staff immunised with the flu vaccine. Jean Freeman. The Chief Medical Officer wrote to the NHS in August reiterating the importance of the flu vaccine to staff, especially for those directly involved in patient care, and we have instructed boards that every effort should be made to offer the vaccine in a way that is accessible to all staff, regardless of location and working pattern. In addition, there are national resources, uh, including a toolkit that can be used by staff to plan their local flu campaign. And this year, that includes uh, as an edit of our television advert and also includes an interactive app that has previously been used successfully in other parts of the UK and is designed to drive uptake for healthcare workers. Liam Kerr. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer. Recent figures show that 45% of NHS Scotland staff eligible to receive the vaccine have done. In NHS England, that figure is 68%. Now, in England, staff who refuse the vaccine are moved from critical areas if they work with vulnerable patients, which seems eminently sensible. So can the Cabinet Secretary confirm NHS Scotland is aware of this and when it will introduce a similar scheme before it is too late? Jean Freeman. Uh, I thank Mr um, uh, Kerr for that answer. Um, we are aware of the uh, situation in England and indeed the app that I refer to is one that we know has been successful there in driving up uh, the uptake. What, what we have in Scotland though, and it's very important in terms of how our NHS uh, works in Scotland, is that we have a very clear partnership approach with our staff 
uh, with our unions and our staff side and, and other representatives of our staff uh, in order to uh, ensure that we work together collaboratively across a range of matters. And so I would be very reluctant indeed to start issuing diktats about moving staff or not moving staff, uh, certainly without the continuing discussion in those partnership forums at national level and individual board levels to find ways by which we continue, can continue to improve the uptake. It has gone up in the last two years. Our target for this year is, as Mr Kerr said, 60%. And I have personally seen a number of innovative approaches by staff to encourage their peers uh, to uh, be vaccinated, not least uh, in RAH, where I visited recently to launch the flu vaccine campaign. Question number 14, James Kelly. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what proportion of HIP operations have been carried out within the 12-week treatment time guarantee in NHS Greater Glasgow and, Tw and Clyde in 2018. Jean Freeman. Uh, waiting time information is collected at specialty level and not by procedure. However, that said, in the year to the 30th of June uh, 2018, 48% of orthopaedic inpatient and day case procedures were carried out within 12 weeks. And um, I'm sure as Mr uh, Kelly and I will absolutely agree that this level of performance is unacceptably low. The Health Board have begun work to address this by improving theatre utilisation, making full use of capacity at Golden Jubilee National Hospital and having additional activity in evenings and weekends. The plan I published yesterday will provide more investment to this and other boards to increase capacity and improve performance. James Kelly. 8% level of performance is unacceptably low and it's witnessed by my constituent, Mr Paul O'Brien, has had to wait almost 18 months to receive an orthopaedic appointment. Uh, following numerous scans, he was placed on the waiting list in February, and as recently as September, uh, he was advised that there was still no appointment available for him, and he's off work as a result and suffering constant pain. The NHS boards confirmed to me that it's unable to meet its 12-week uh, time guarantee in orthopaedic appointments because it doesn't have the capacity so why should anyone trust what uh, Ms Freeman and the government say on the NHS when people like Mr O'Brien are waiting years for a hip operation? Jean Freeman. Uh, I thank Mr Kelly for that supplementary question and uh, agree with him absolutely that the situation uh, his constituent has faced is unacceptable and one that I am very sorry for. Uh, the plan that I published yesterday is a plan about increasing capacity, precisely to address the issues that have been identified and indeed the issues that that health board uh, have raised with uh, Mr Kelly himself. That said, uh, what is clear in Greater Glasgow and Clyde is that the capacity they did have was not being fully utilised. So there are two parts to this work. One is to ensure that individual boards are fully utilising their capacity. That is part also of, for example, uh, the example I gave yesterday in Forth Valley. But the other is a significant additional investment announced yesterday alongside a clear phased plan to introduce additional capacity and to produce a sustainable service to deal with these waiting time matters. Question number 15, Jackie Bailey. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to reduce orthopaedic and ophthalmology waiting times in NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Jean Freeman. Uh, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde has redesigned a number of orthopaedic pathways to increase capacity, for example, in hip and knee post operative pathways, plus foot and ankle community services. This does increase capacity in other orthopaedic service areas. In addition, the plan, as I said earlier, that I announced uh, yesterday, uh, will uh, provide additional capacity to Greater Glasgow and Clyde as a board, but also through uh, the additional use that they will be able to make, uh, along with other boards of the Golden Jubilee National Hospital, with the additional CT scanner uh, coming in early next year, throughput of cataract op operations, additional ophthalmology staff, and then moving on uh, to the phase two of Golden Jubilee's expansion. All of this will, in addition to checking that the capacity that is already there is being fully utilised and looking, as I said in the previous answer, at evening and weekend working, uh, all of this uh, is designed to increase capacity and improve performance. Jackie Bailey. 
aware that the Golden Jubilee, Scotland's national waiting times hospital, is actually within Greater Glasgow and Clyde on the doorstep of my constituency. Yet despite increasing waiting times of nine months to a year um, for patients, thousands of them, waiting in pain, they send a tiny proportion of cases to the Golden Jubilee. So does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that actually the most important consideration here are the patients? And will she tell Greater Glasgow and Clyde to make better use of the Golden Jubilee so that people don't need to suffer any longer? Jean Freeman. Um, I'm grateful um, to Ms Bailey for her supplementary question on an issue that she and I have discussed many, many times, uh, including prior to uh, my appearing in this place. Um, I do agree that it, it, the most important consideration is patients. I would also agree that what is a Golden Jubilee and, as Ms Bailey said, our National Waiting Time Centre uh, is not always utilised by uh, colleague boards as well as it should be. And that is something that we are uh, taking an active, active interest in. But it is a national waiting time centre and it is there to provide that additional capacity uh, for all of our health boards and indeed does so uh, for some in our island communities. But it is because of the success of the Golden Jubilee in the work that it does uh, and the success in terms of patient experience and patient outcomes, that the very model that is the Golden Jubilee is the model that will underpin the new elective centre programme uh, and the elective centres and their delivery, which I announced yesterday. That concludes portfolio questions. Uh, I would ask members to note that despite going over time, we still only got to, I think, number 14. So to consider uh, the length of time Supplementary questions and answers are taking for the future.